Okay, we are live. Hey everyone, welcome to this video today. We're gonna wait for a couple of you to get on here because today I'm talking with Emma Natter and we are going to talk about the importance of building story in your brand to get your message out there, which is pretty much my favorite topic in the whole world because I was an English major. I have done nothing but write stories, tell stories, live stories for so long. And I feel like that is truly the key to a long lasting business is to really have a brand that is based around storytelling. So if you're a photographer, a stylist, a florist, pretty much everything you do is around telling a story. And what you're probably trying to do is tell your client's story in the best way possible, but you get to do that through your own lens. Um, so as soon as Emma gets on here, I just had a thought and I'm writing it down because I'm gonna bring it up. Because it's gonna be genius. Uh, so as soon as Emma gets on, we'll start. But a little about me, I wanted to be a writer. I was deeply involved in stories ever since I was a young girl. And um, I started keeping a diary very, very intently right after I read The Diary of Anne Frank. And since then, I've just have masses and masses and masses of handwritten notebooks where I've really kept the stories of my life. Um, ooh, Emma's here. Okay, how do I do it? Okay, go live with Emma. Okay. So thank you. Thank you all for coming on this call. We're waiting for Emma and I don't really know what it does. Hey! It show. Oh, it shows both of us. I need to adjust to, so it's not just like my head. Hey, Emma. Hi, sorry. Lip screen. It's very it's Andy Warhol. You look nice and then I missed you going live, so sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. I have one corner of my house that's really clean. The rest <laughs> is uh, a disaster right now. So I'm in the corner in the corner of my living room. So welcome, Emma, to the call. So excited to have you here and so excited for this new feature on Instagram that we can be in different locations and still get on and chat with everybody. Yeah, I'm really excited about it too. This is and my first one. Oh, awesome. I don't know if you're frozen or can you hear me? Or we I already have you a now. Okay, perfect. Well, if ever Emma pauses, I'm just going to start awkwardly talking about things. So, okay. So Emma, I was just sort of telling my background with story and then I'll pass it over to you to talk to you a little bit about story. So when my obsession, fascination, one is storytelling and two is helping people grow into their purpose, their passion, living their dreams um, and making money while they do it so that they don't have to live little lives and boring cubicles, uh, you know, just working the daily grind. I really feel like our world is evolving from that. There's like that old school world where it was the nine to five. Our parents had these retirement plans. They stayed at the same job for 30 years. Everybody kind of went to college, got the BA, graduated, found a job and stayed in it forever. And I truly think the world is rapidly changing to something different, where I actually believe that college education is going away and that most people are learning now from mentors and online courses to learn how to run their entrepreneurial business. And that colleges aren't actually the most up-to-date way to get a good education. So I grew up very based in story. And since I started my business, I've been very, very based in story. What about you, Emma? I know you and I have oh. similar backgrounds a little bit. <clears throat> um, yeah, really similar in that way in that, um, you know, I, I go back and forth a lot with what you're talking about where it's like, like it's like all my business education has not come from college, but I feel like what has really given me, you know, people talk about these like unfair advantages, like that kind of thing. I feel like that did come from my college background in like, so I did mine in um, English and it was like creative, well, it was literature. And then I did, and then I did an MFA in creative writing. And so for me, everything has just always been about story. Like every time I have my husband, Michael read over stuff for me. And every time that there's an issue, he's like, 
Why aren't you just telling a story? That's what you do. That's what people connect with. Just tell a story. Why are you writing an email where you're talking about all this abstract things and maybe you start sounding like this weird valley girl because you're trying to sound like the people that you really admire who are like really smart, but they're just like fun. And, and he's like, you need to tell a story because that's where people connect with you. And so that's really what like, I, I'm like an analyzer type. Like I like to figure out what works and that's what I did for so long in terms of storytelling. That's how I kind of see the world. That's how I understand everything is through story. I like thinking about, you know, who the main players are, the characters. I like to think about, you know, what the main, like the main conflict is, like the major dramatic question, like anything. I, I can take anything that I, that I learned in college about storytelling and that I've just thought about so much of my life afterwards and I apply all that to business. So like everything for me is story and it, and it always has been and I think it always will be. Yeah, that's, that's such a good point about education. So my undergrad was in English and French and I was kind of minoring in drama and screenwriting and then I went to NYU for my master's degree and studied directing and storytelling, plays, movies, TV. We studied all the great films, all the great literature. And I do feel like that did give me an advantage with knowing how to compose. Like when I approach a wedding day, I actually approach it like I am shooting a small movie. Like I really try and get to know my main characters, my leading lady, my leading man. And I have a series of questions that I ask them to get to know them. I understand what's important to them, the plot points that they want. You know, I actually storyboard out every single, um, every single shoot, every single style shoot that I do. I sort of storyboard the night before. Um, I'm not a great sketch artist. So mine are like stick figures, but I have, I try to get an idea of what I want to shoot and the story behind that. And actually this might be an interesting time. So Emma is coming and she is styling the Utah workshop for the path workshops, which is my cheapest, most affordable workshop because it's in Utah where things are cheap and awesome and we love it. Um, and what Emma came up with and what I'm doing currently, and I realized it's something I did just not as formal as this, is we're actually writing a script for the attendees to follow for the styled shoot. So they're going to actually see how you can take your characters through a script in getting the shoot going. And we have a couple of shoots planned, but I think it's going to be such a different approach than when you just go to a workshop. First of all, I hate it when it feels like a cattle call. I hate it when it's just 12 photographers lined up all trying to get some semblance of a shot. Like I don't play that way. I think it's because I used to teach drama and I'd have like 40 kids in a class. Like I'm very organized and have the story set out. So I've told Emma, you know, we're gonna shoot in station so we can each formulate the story. And then with our characters, we'll have them kind of go through the script, which is gonna be really exciting. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. I hope, I hope there's some, I want you to surprise me. <laughs> well, I'm writing two of them because um, we're going to have two different couples. So this is my first path workshop where I'm actually bringing in a gay couple. And I'm really, really excited. I'm a little nervous to do that in Utah, to be honest. I'm hoping attendees will, um, even if, you know, I don't know, we're not going into po politics. But so we're gonna, going to have two couples. We're going to have a man and woman couple. And then I just found the most beautiful, handsomest most attractive gay couple in the nicest tuxedos who are also going to be doing a little bit of our storytelling with us as well. Yeah, you didn't tell me that. This is I fun. just did it like the other day. So it just happened yesterday. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but awesome. I really wanted to, I, it's been because I've been looking at my website and realizing my website, no matter how much I travel and try, is still predominantly white heterosexual couples, which is fine. But my biggest booking this year is for this like entrepreneur, millionaire, amazing couple, gay couple. They're getting married in this amazing airport hangar. They have a drag queen coming to their um, reception. It's just going to be the most exciting wedding ever. And I realize I'm just not marketing very well to some of these higher end couples who are being left out because... We all sort of have a one-track mind of how our style shoots would look. So, um, cool. Ooh, we have questions already, and I have not been looking at them. Okay, okay, maybe not a lot of questions. All right, so, Emma, you have a couple of points on story, and then I can talk about my two points that I wrote down. Um, so, let me, do you want to start with your 
main, like a little summary of what you're talking about with the importance of story? Yeah, I wrote down notes. <laughs> awesome, I did too. I'm a note taker. I'm, a, I'm like, I have all my points right here. <laughs> yeah, I've got them. So Darcy asked me to think about, you know, just to think about three ways that story has made an impact for my brand. And so that's something that um, I think Darcy and I both, uh, like, I feel like we're really similar in that both of us, like, really recognize the power of story and are completely dedicated to harnessing that in every way that we can. Um, and yeah. it's cool because, because I think we approach it in similar ways, but also different ways. And so I always have so much fun shooting with Darcy because I can totally see the way that she's thinking about it like a movie. And I feel like mine feels a little bit, maybe more like an essay or something like that. And so um, anyway, so I really love, I really love when we get to work together, which is why you guys should come to Utah to the Path Workshop. But, I love um, working with you. It's so fun. <laughs> um, so a few things that I was thinking of is the main ways I feel like uh, story plays out in my brand is um, obviously through the imagery um, is one of the huge ways. And I feel like this is something that um, took, took some time for me because I felt like I had it in my brain and in my heart what was really so important to me and what I really wanted to communicate as my brand, but I didn't have the storytelling on par with like how, how deeply I felt about it. And that's something that you really helped me to be able to do is to elevate that in that way. And Darcy's really good at that. And so, um, but now instead of like, I'd always, anyway, so in the imagery, it's always really important to me. And like, if you go through like my Instagram feed or on my website or something, um, I always try to make sure that everything is super cohesive. Obviously, we always talk about that. But I think there's so much that we talk about, like, branding needs to be cohesive, needs to have, like, needs to be this and this and this. But I feel like what we don't talk about enough is the about, like, brand can be so many different things. It can be the graphic design. It can be the imagery. It can be the way that you talk. But what's at the center of all that is your message. And so for me, like... Like, I don't know, the way that I want the models on my feed to look, I make sure that, you know, they're communicating this message of openness, honesty, um, maybe a little bit of humility, you know, things like that, so that I have that elevation, but there's also behind it. And so that's always really important to me to be able to do, to, to have a message behind the imagery. And then obviously, like when I'm preparing for a photo shoot, I'm just like always... Like I've got a whole proposal down and I've got concepts in mind and I'm not just looking for like, what is, what are people shooting right now? Like, what should I, what should I have in my portfolio? I think about like, what do I want to communicate to people who are going to be looking at my images? Um, what, what are the people that I want to attract? What are they attracted to? And they're the people that are attracted to my work. They're attracted to things that feel authentic and feel honest and feel yeah. beautiful. Um, and so I try to always communicate that in, in all my imagery then sorry i'm like dragging on then the other uh one of the other i feel like the other the second thing is with my writing and so mm -hmm. i didn't realize when i started a business that like writing is like it's like i feel like it's like 70 percent of the marketing game or something yeah. like that oh it is well, oh completely it's it's nuts and and so then it's like and and it took me a lot of time because i was so frustrated because i was like i know how to write a short story i know how to write an essay i mean like i'm not the best writer in the world but like i know how to do it you know like i can do that but um but i couldn't figure out how to transfer that to copywriting for a long time mm -hmm. but i feel like finally i started hitting on some points that people really resonate with um and every time it's with stories and so so much of that is in caption writing. And so in my captions, um, people really resonate, especially when I tell a story. And then in my email marketing, it's like uh, all of a sudden I, you know, it's everybody's like email marketing, email marketing, email marketing. And it's like, you can have like the most awesome email funnel ever. But if your writing isn't connecting to anybody that you're writing to, if you're not telling stories, it doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> and so, and so finally I started, you know, when you start to get the emails back that say, you know, I'm so glad that you sent this out today. This really has like changed the way that I'm thinking about things. I'm so glad that I read this today. It's exactly what I needed. And it's because I told them the story of something that happened to me. 
you know? And yeah. so that's, that's a huge part of storytelling because then it helps people be able to trust me and to feel like they, you know, like, I feel like every time I have a client reach out to me, it's because it's like, they're already like 95% of the way there because they're like, well, I've considered these other people, but I really resonate with what you're saying. And I want mm -hmm. to, I want to do what I want to work with you because of what you do. And that's mm -hmm. all because of the email marketing. And then um, the last one is just like Instagram stories. And so I, and, and like Instagram stories, I feel like is somewhere in between that. But I feel like, you know, the there's imagery, there's writing, and then there's like speaking and talking. And so like just being able to get on and people just recognize my face and they see who I am and they feel like they're connected to me. Um, anyway, I feel like that's that's a big thing. And, and, and I always try to think about like making sure that my Instagram stories have like a beginning, middle and an end. So it's not just like some random thing that happens. It's like, there's so many people who are like, they're amazing. They're amazing at what they do. And then like their Instagram stories, is like a random, like boomerang of their coffee. And I'm like, why <laughs> what does this have anything to do with your message? You know what I yeah. mean? And it's like, I mean, you do hilarious ones and that's like part of what you do, but it's like, it's like this ongoing story of like hilarious things in Darcy's life. But it's, so it's not like these one-off things you're like, Oh, she's like, tells these funny things like that. And so anyway, like you can do it if you can do it pull it off like darcy then you can do it but lots of people tell <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's um, um that's very very true like so part of my brand is actually humor because i secretly want to be a stand-up comedian not even secretly i'm very open about it i take a microphone if there's ever one even in the room i'll just start telling um weird stories or something like that but humor is very much a part of my brand and my story so for me those little random moments where i'm like uh super zooming magic mic strip dancing on a friday night like that's like my friday night you know and i kind of bring it in i don't go to the inappropriate places but for me I bring that a lot to the things that I shoot, even though I'm shooting these higher end weddings. Um, and there are some times when I tame it down, but my higher end weddings, in all honesty, they are not watching my Instagram stories. I don't think any of them ever have. But for me, what feeds off of what you just said, why I think story is so important. And yes, you have to write more than what you think you um, write. Now for me, copywriting is really easy. I come up with ideas for my clients when I'm coaching. I make them all record all of their calls because I'll just say like, who say it like this or do this or I come up with these ideas and I give I'm like, ah, oh, I should keep that for myself. But it's just like an endless supply <laughs> once you get into the groove of copywriting. For me, what it really is about telling a story is the level of self awareness you have about yourself obviously that's what self-awareness is, but the awareness you have about yourself, your story, who you are, what brings people to you, in all honesty, for me, that keeps the competition fears away. Because whenever I get into that fearful place, which we all do, because we're all self-employed and we, you know, we all think that there's like a limited number of clients who can hire us or whatever. I actually don't really believe that. And I don't get too worried when other people pop up, even if they're doing similar things to me. Like you said, you and I do similar things, but here I am on an Instagram live with you because I don't actually feel like there's a big level of competition in the sense that your voice, my voice, very different. And so our people who are attracted to each of us are attracted to those stories that we tell, you know, and when you're self-aware, when you know the stories that hit home for you, for me, a lot of mine are stories of traveling the world. They're stories of my passion and dedication to helping businesses thrive. My, my knowing absolute in my core <clears throat> that there's more than enough money to go around and that people can build a six-figure business and not have to live stressed out and crazy and tired, like that's part of it. So when we're self-aware, what makes me me? My sense of humor, that's part of it. What do I bring to the table? What do I have to offer? And how can I not be afraid to show it? I can't tell you, and some of them are on this call, I see them, but people who have really compelling stories, and yet they're too afraid to turn the camera on themselves because they're worried about what people will think of them, or they're worried about how it will look to their community, or they're worried that they'll look self-centered, or they're worried that truthfully that they're going to let their talents out and then they might um 
get judged by other people. You know, women can be hard on each other. As much as we can be supportive, other women can be quite hard on people. So to be a really successful entrepreneur, I think you just have to not give an F-U-C-K about what other people think of you. You just really don't, except for in terms of customer service. I'm not saying like, just be crazy, but not having them, their opinions of what they're, they're doing. Like, listen, you guys, my parents still are not quite sure what I'm doing with my two degrees. They're like, so you're not going to a place to work. What do you do exactly? Like, they're still so utterly confused because they both, you know, come from a background where you go to a nine to five job, you have the 401k and, you know, they actually aren't, they don't make a lot of money. I just bought my parents a really nice luxury couch for their get together room. So all my siblings can sit on the couch and watch movies because they really want their kids to come back. And it's so freeing for me to be like, well, you may not know what I do, but I'm going to buy you a new couch, you know, to give back to my parents in that way, who they've just worked so hard their whole lives without really having anything nice to show for it because they kind of gave into the societal pressures of, do this, don't branch out, don't go here, be in this space, this is how you raise your kids, this is what you do. And so my parents never took a lot of risks. And the more I interview millionaires and billionaires and talk to people, it's really your level of risk and your level of self-knowledge. So for me, that's where story really comes into play. The one last thing I'll say about story too, and then we can open it up for questions, is... Um, <clears throat> I believe the power of story and what every story illustrates is the method of changing the way you think. So I will keep coming back to the Oprah speech at the Golden Globes forever and ever because she started off Same. with the story of she, you guys go watch it. It's such a compelling, compelling example of the power of story because she goes through and she tells four stories in that speech. So her first speech is Oprah and you just picture this on an old linoleum floor in the South, poor, and on TV, she sees Sidney Poitier go up and accept an Oscar award. And that moment changed her life. Now, Oprah could have said, you know, hey, when I was little, I got, I came to the realization that I could um, be a black woman and be on the stage. But instead, she illustrates it with Sidney Poitier. And then she goes on to illustrate with another woman. And then she illustrates how that woman, and I can't remember that woman's name, I'm so sorry, I don't wanna get it wrong. But how that woman, you know, went to the NAACP and then one of the people who helped on her case was Rosa Parks. And then two months after she helped on that case, Rosa Parks decided not to stand up and move off that bus. And those are the things that draw us in. So for me, what story does is it changes the way we think about the world. And most of the time, if it's a compelling, good story, it allows you to think bigger. And that's what I think holds us back as entrepreneurs, as friends, as lovers, as parents, is we get locked in to how we see everybody else doing stuff when we get locked in this loop of the other story. Like, I always think of Leave it to Beaver. Not a very compelling story because it was all about being the same. <clears throat> That's why people are like, oh, old Leave it to Beaver episodes. I'm like, if you watch that, the formula of Leave it to Beaver is the most boring thing. You know, no, no hate to Leave it to Beaver, but it was not a compelling story. It was a story about mediocrity and um, what's the word? It's kind of like, the word's slipping me, but basically where everybody's the same, right? Where you mm -hmm. just cannot break out of that mold. But compelling stories really help you see how you break out of that mold how you branch out, how you make what is within you more compelling. So for me, that's, that's really like the key for storytelling. Okay, we have a couple of questions. Guilty of fear to turn the camera around. Oh, I almost fell over. Um, and <laughs> stop talking about me to prove a point. I was totally talking about you. I was totally talking about you, Jamie. <laughs> I, you. Um, I saw her on here and I'm like, I'm gonna pull Jamie up to the spotlight. So uh, one question from Rebecca Lynn, what are the best ways to really become self-aware? <gasps> That's like the best question. Do you wanna tackle that, Emma? Um, oh gosh. Oh my gosh, have you read this book? I just read it, uh, Maybe It's You. No, I haven't read that one. It's called, it's called Maybe It's You, and it's like cut the crap, uh, face your fears, and live the life of your dreams or something like that. And so all these exercises you go through and you have to go through all the 
such painful things and like like just releasing yourself from all of these things that you think you have to do and you go through talking about your parents and you go through talking about memories and memories that haunt you and limiting beliefs that you have and really having like a and you come up with like a you write a paragraph of your dream for your body and your dream for yourself and your dream for your career and your dream for your home and you write them out so that you can see okay now what's the difference between what my dream is and where i am now and mm -hmm. you have to go through it's very painful so i love that i also think talking to other people and people that you really trust and that really care about you like like i feel like it's so many business courses that i've taken it's like go and ask people what their favorite things are about you mm -hmm. and, or like what, what, what your biggest strengths are. And I remember doing that. And then people were just like, you're a great friend. And I was like, <laughs> really? I don't even know if I'm that great of a friend. Like uh, there has to be more than this, you know? And so I think it's, but, but having really good conversations with people who are thoughtful mm -hmm. and who are, um, who, who are good at seeing patterns and you know, are like analysis type people that's who you can talk to. I think yeah. like having conversations is great. Yeah, I always say boring people kind of give boring answers. So if I ever ask people, I try and ask my most creative friends because they won't ever say, you're a good friend because it's just like a given. I'm just like, no, no, I won't accept that answer. But I love this question. So Rebecca Lynn, for me, it's a lifelong journey, self-awareness. So I'm currently working with one mentor. I work a lot with like people who have skills that I want to learn. So she's actually kind of a therapist she re and a hypnotist, and she repatterns thoughts. I do a lot of crazy shit, you guys. So somebody asked me. I got yeah, somebody texted me yesterday. It was like, who's your sound therapy bowl lady? I'm like, if you're ready for it, I will tell you. But that is the kind of stuff I do. So what she does is she, <laughs> each time that I work with her, it's about a 90-minute time frame. And we'll choose sort of a traumatic thing that happened to me in my past. As easy as I remember once, it was in the seventh grade. I was a dorky, glasses, chubby girl. And um, these cute little petite blonde girls were sitting behind me. And the teacher was talking about fractions or something. And she was like, so I'll give Darcy this portion of the pie. And the girl said, and I know this doesn't sound like it's, it's totally bullying. I mean, but they're like, I bet Darcy will eat the whole pie, right? And at that mm -hmm. moment, like this, I know, I know, junior high is the worst. Like never, I never want to go back there ever. But like in that moment in my life, it became very unsafe for me to raise my hand and, and volunteer an answer, even though I knew the answer. I was a very smart kid. But after I had raised my hand to answer that question, they had said that comment, I wouldn't answer questions anymore. And it got really bad to where... I was in classes and sometimes some of the classes I would take were, and I find this happens if I'm in a course and it's mostly male dominated, which now that I take a lot of marketing classes and stuff, majority of people in there are male, not female. And so I can get a little insecure when it's a room full of guys, like they'll judge me if I raise my hand. I'm more comfortable with women, but I've actually even broken through that. But I had to sort of work through that trauma, that moment where, tr where traumatic things happen to us. And then we make a decision about the world and how the world is, right? So I made a decision from that moment in my seventh grade cooking class, that answering questions was not a safe thing. And so when you work with people who can kind of work you through that trauma, and then you make, you kind of switch your thoughts around, you release yourself from that because of course we know it's totally fine to raise your hand, answer questions and think about it. I think a lot of us have trauma with that, especially if we're in a male dominated space. I feel like women will often just out of training in our society be silent because they're more afraid to make a mistake in front of a male audience than a female audience. Um, and that for me is like kind of the next step women get to go. It's why I am into marketing and why I go to marketing conferences that are not photography related because I see a whole different way of how people think. But so for self-awareness for me, I really work on taking those old patterns, those old traumas, reframing them, and then that causes me to make different decisions. Where, you know, I used to not wanna make YouTube videos. I know everything comes back to my double chin, but like, I was really nervous about having a double chin on YouTube videos. I know this sounds so silly because, um, but it doesn't really, because I bet all of you have something and you have some reason why you couldn't do a YouTube video or why you couldn't do a live or why you're not gonna speak up or why you can't raise your prices or why you're not bringing in the client that you want. 
all of it's related, you guys. All of it is so related. So for me, that's a huge thing about self-awareness. Um, mm -hmm. Hi, Celine. So do, does anybody have any questions about business that Emma and I can answer before we log off? I do want to, while you're typing them, please type them below. If you have any questions about story, business, marketing, anything like that, we're ready to tackle it. But Emma and I are doing a workshop here in Utah. It's April 16th, 17th, and 18th. Sarah Winward, who just did this gorgeous shoot where she provided the florals for Jessica Chastain's new, like, big shoot in this magazine. She's doing our flowers. She's getting so famous. I'm so glad she still says yes to me. Um, she'll be doing the bouquets and a lot of details. And we'll be doing um, <clears throat> one night of, like, welcome, dinner, uh, conversation. You'll get your workbooks. We're going to talk a lot about storytelling. And then the next day, we're doing two big shoots, one in a studio and one out at the Utah Salt Flats. And the one at the Utah Salt Flats will have two couples, like I said, and you'll have scripts. And we're going to try something really different to getting more a more cohesive story to your to your work um, and getting it published. And also, I'll, I talk a lot about how to use it for Instagram, your photography for Instagram, Pinterest, and really booking clients in a long-term way that way. And then the 18th is a business power day. I've got 90 pages. We're going to walk through your Pinterest plan. We're going to walk through your marketing plan. We're going to walk through what email marketing is. We're going to walk through how to book those clients, how to get your story out there, branding. And at the end of the conference, we do the hot seat, which people are most scared of, but they say it's the most um, benefit that they get is I will have each of you come up and you will tell us the biggest struggle of your business. And then I will talk to you for about five to 10 minutes and I will tell you the exact steps I would take right now to bring money into your business. And it kind of just is really fun for people and I get really specific and I'll probably call you on your bullshit when you have excuses of why you're not bringing in money. <laughs> and I'll give you um, some really good tips on how to make a more foundational business. Okay, Emma, so our next um, question, we have a few. So what is your best marketing tip for high-end wedding clientele? Um, that comes from my friend Jamie. For me, it's really getting in with planners and having a really good relationship with planners, which I talk a lot about. My biggest high-end weddings come from um, two different planners that I have really golden relationships with, and they just send them to me like clockwork, and it's the most amazing. Now, how do you get in with those planners? It's kind of a longer topic. Um, I do believe a lot of it is magic uh, in the sense that when you're working, <laughs> it's just magic. I just live a really lucky life. I'll just go to the coffee shop and That's the your marketing sitting there. I'll be like, are you magic. a planner? Let's meet. I kid you not, that is how a lot of it happens for me. But I think it's because of the good things I'm putting in consistent motion in my business. Do you have another, um, do you have any tips on that, Emma? Well, I think, like you said this in the contacts group that I, I went through, and I read that really long feed where you're responding to everybody. And one thing that you said was just like, make it so that you can't be ignored. So if you're, if you're like, oh, this planner keeps booking this person and this person, and I'm just as good as them. It's like, well, what do you have? Like, why, why would they, it's so much easier to just go back to the same people. So what are you putting out there that they absolutely can't ignore? Because if, 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 if you're putting something out there that they're like, oh my gosh, I really want to work with her. You know what I mean? It's going to be, it's just going to make such a huge difference. So I think yeah. I, I love that. And, and Darcy's fearless in that way. And I think so much of it, like some of the photographers that I've worked with, I know there's a lot of fear around it and you want to shoot safe and you want to make sure that you, it, it's all like technical instead of really putting that story behind it, which is I meant to do that to circle back around to our theme today. That was good. That was good. That was beautiful. Brilliantly orchestrated. You're a master storyteller. Okay, our next question. How do you guide non-models through a story in a session? Oh, it's easy. It's like you just direct them. <laughs> Doesn't that sound easy? So, um, like, it's my dream. You, you just tell, tell them exactly what, to, what do. to do. You just get really bossy. I'm just super bossy. Um, Here's the truth about how to guide non-models through a story in a session. You need to have a vision of what their vision is. So if they, they will be non-models and they will be terrified and they will be stiff, um, keeping a little thing of vodka in and just making the guy do some shots, that helps. Uh, but no, for real, what I do is I get very clear on the vision they want because I know if they're coming to me, they want that ultimate epic 
romance, high-end, film, glamour, editorial look. So I have to become a master director. So it's not about them at all. If you, you can help people through your skills know exactly how to pose. I mean, to the point where the, one of the reasons um, this uh, amazing gay couple just booked me is because I had photographed him at this entrepreneurial conference that I shoot every year. It's my commercial side of my business. And I had to take his headshot because he was a nominee last year. And he said, you know, one of the reasons I want to book you for my wedding is you told me how far to put my chin down and where to move and where to look. And he goes, you got my picture done. And it was the best headshot I've ever had. And you did it in like three minutes. How did you do that? You knew exactly how things should look. So you as a photographer have to have such a strong vision of your own storytelling, how you how you are going to use those images, how that looks, because that's why they're coming to you, because they fell in love with your images. So it is with you. And I do feel like my degree in directing helped me get that. But also just being like, completely obsessed with, like Emma said, creating things that people will take notice of. Yeah, like do you have any like, thoughts about that, Emma? Well, I was just gonna kind of say too, like when you took my headshots, I remember like the, you can see up in the top corner, that's Darcy's work. Like I, you gave that back to me and I have never felt like so beautiful in my entire life. And I'm like, I don't even know if she Photoshopped it. I don't even care if she Photoshopped anything in it. But like, <laughs> but like you, that's exactly what you did. You told me where to put my chin. You told me I needed to put my shoulders down so that my neck could be a little bit longer. You told me where to look. Kept trying to get me to <laughs> close my mouth and sometimes it just doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but um I think that that's yeah anyway I think I was just going to second that that like being photographed by you and I yeah being photographed by you I felt so confident in that and I think like so many people spend so many photographers spend so much time like putting together these epic shoots and having to photograph 10 different things at the same time and it's like I just want like like if you can just take one person and photograph one person really well and like not have all these other things in mind and like just be able to take a really good portrait like I don't know like that that's so valuable and I think photographers yeah. kind of forget that sometimes yeah excuse me I'm drinking a kombucha that did not go well um yes uh, um, excuse me I'm just gonna burp in response to that yes I agree with that I think portrait work is absolutely a responsibility of a photographer. I shoot all my portrait work on film, which can be scary, right? Because, but it has made me a better director because the thing with digital, I shoot digital too, I'm a hybrid, but you can take so many at once hoping to get something right. That you actually don't know the formula of what you did to get it right. So it's hard to get it right. With film, you know, I have a personal project I work on. I take two rolls, that's 32 shots, only and I walk them through a whole sequence of really getting their portraits in black and white film it's my wet hair series but that personal that project has made me such a better understander if that's a word of of how to pose people so I agree with that okay lyric dear has a question people keep complimenting my photography but I'm not getting many clients what can I do to get myself out there more I'm so sorry to laugh but it's such a thing in this business to be like you're amazing and you think that that means they're going to book you and they never will so my first question is is it other photographers complimenting you or is it is it your parents friends like who is complimenting you because honestly the people complimenting you are probably not people who spend money on photographs they might just be people who are like that's really pretty and you can never have any expectation that those people will buy from you unless you find a better way to sell so whenever somebody is not booking you it's because you haven't given them first of all i this is a this this does relate but i remember in my business like third year in i said to um someone well I was saying to my business coach, I really want to book a $10,000 wedding. She's like, great, send over your pricing. And she's like, Darcy, this may seem obvious to you, but you don't have a $10,000 package on your pricing. I'm like, oh, <laughs> like, how do you think you're going to book a $10,000 wedding? I'm like, that's why I'm paying you thousands of dollars. Thank you for pointing that out to me. Um, so for me, when people aren't booking something I want, 
I probably haven't made the offer or the opportunity clear enough. So that's without knowing your situation very well, that's the first thing I would say is the offer and the opportunity of, you know, for me creating that opportunity of me booking a $10,000 wedding had to start with my pricing. And now, um, and I, I did it. I changed my pricing two weeks later. I booked an $11,000 package, beautiful wedding. Amazing. They found Such an off. overachiever. <clears throat> Couldn't even just be 10,000. No, it wasn't. <laughs> I was like, heck, if I have to make a ten thousand dollar package, I'm gonna make a eleven. I'm gonna make a, an eleven, and then I'm gonna make an eighteen. Now my highest package is twenty one thousand. Nobody's booked that one yet, but they've gotten pretty close. Um, but I always think the moment somebody books your top package, it's t time to raise your prices. That's just a game I play. Okay, Emma, do you have anything else to say about that? Um, yeah, I was just thinking that like, sometimes I feel like, like, I don't know your situation at all. Um, the, our, our friend here who asked, but I feel like sometimes, especially if you're like at the beginning, sometimes like people don't trust you to have like a full, like big legitimate package and you have to figure out something that's both worth your time and th like a smaller price point package and not like being like, I'm going to shoot a whole wedding for $500, but like being like, okay, yeah. what's a what's a $200 package that's worth my time and the experience that I'm going to be able to get and then be able to figure out how to like package that. And, and I think there's like a lot that you can do like on, you could, you could do like an Instagram live where you teach something about how they can prepare for that. And then the obvious next step for, would be for them to, to book this small package that you have and you have some kind of special deal if they do on the Instagram live, you know, just different things like that where you can add a little bit of urgency and scarcity and start at a, at a price point that you feel confident that it's both worth your time and is something that you can offer a value, but that's just at, at, at a smaller space. Oh my gosh. That is so, so, so true. I always laugh when brand new photographers come to me and they're like, well, I'm going to charge five grand because I deserve it. And I'm like, do you, do you really like, are you really, if you've never shot, I don't think if you've shot less than 40 weddings, you should be charging five grand, but I'm a little crazy unless you're like some kind of genius, but you've got to put in your dues. You've got to make those price points so you can book the easier clients because a lot of times it is easier to book the cheaper clients. It does get a little harder, the higher up you go, just in terms of marketing to them, the level, you know, the level of where they're at. But yeah, I think having that offer or something that is a good price point, that makes a lot of sense. That's genius. Okay, Art from Artful Messages, who I get to meet at the Hybrid Co. in Texas says, how do you break out of one industry and lead into the next bigger service product you want to offer? Um, you just do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I guess I would need to, for me, it would be helpful to know what you want to branch out of. So I know that you do paper, right? But I'm not quite sure what you want to go into. Emma, do you know what she wants to go into? And then we can get specific. Not that I'm we not need to sure. Like, we talked about, like we've talked about her, um, like working with bigger brands to do like a ton of the like inserts for like their packaging work or something. Mm. So it would just be huge, huge things at a time. And it would be different than... And, and it would be marketing to different people than her main client base right now is like clicker, wedding calligraphers. So I yeah. think that might be it. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I want to speak to a specific, but I'll just give you a personal example for me. So I'm still very much known as a wedding photographer. It's what I, my website's about. I haven't even had a commercial website the last five years of my business. I'm finally getting one this year, but my commercial jobs come in through a different platform. So my commercial, my commercial jobs are high end design companies um, who do work for, for big corporations like um, investment uh, advent, venture capitalists. Like that's somebody that I've shot for. And those jobs consistently bring me in like $10,000 paychecks after the year and you know, I have five or six that I do. That's fifty or sixty thousand dollars I'm making with clients that come to me again and again and again. Um, but the way I communicate with them, how I do business with them, is completely different than my wedding photography. And I will say that branching out into a different thing, you have to get like SEO matters. What you're publishing online matters. The relationships you're making, how people are searching for you, matters. But I don't think it's super confusing. I don't feel like I've ever lost out on a wedding 
because I'm doing Sundance parties. In fact, more people think it's cool that I photographed Nicole Kidman and Amy Poehler and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. And they're like, ooh, and you're gonna shoot my wedding. Now I was with a ton of photographers and, at Sundance doing that, but at the same time, it kind of elevated my brand, even though I consider that more commercial work. So I think there's a way, again, if you're self-aware enough, if you're at the core of your story, because my guess is, who you are isn't changing, just the service you're offering is changing and you can still sell that in alignment with your story. That's what I can give you for as little as I know. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add, Emma? I think, well, I think just one of the main things is like what you talked about, like I was just thinking about this too because I'm wanting to start working with a different level client and then all of a sudden I was like, it's not even on my website. What am I even thinking that like, like I don't even have a spot for those kinds of clients to come to me. And so I think it, it's kind of what you're talking about with having that $10,000 package. But I think it's also like sometimes with commercial, I, I've talked to different commercial uh, people who worked with commercial brands and a lot of times it's pitching to them and saying here, this is what the value that I can offer. Yeah. Um, this is what I do. This is what my services look like. And, and for you, Sharon, I would imagine because your, your product is so tax tactile and so beautiful that it would be a matter of sending samples and, and having it really, you know, and, and having some numbers in there to be like, okay, here's, here's what I can offer for what would be valuable. You know, when somebody has this kind of experience, when they receive a package, when they receive your product and they see this handmade paper and it's so soft and the edges are so beautiful, it's going to do, it's going to have this kind of result for your client. And I have, oh, I should connect you with my friend. I just met this friend and that's kind of her thing. She creates experiences for people. So talk to me and I'll connect you with her. Maybe you guys can come up with something good. Yay, awesome. Okay, one of our next questions is, how do you market to couples who want a more editorial film look? I'll just say, you have to post you have to post images with an editorial film look. It's just like, you know, you watch the magic of India Earl growing to 100K. Um, she just really stuck to like couples giving piggyback rides with their hair blowing in the wind. Like that's what, like, and they're just like <laughs> these young hipsters in the, they're always in the wind and the wild and they're so in love. I don't shoot that way. That's not, my, my couples are in their 30s. They're lawyers. No lawyer's going to go frolic up in a mountain, maybe, but not really. So when I saw her, I was like, gosh, that's so good. But she stuck so true to that on her Instagram feed. You just have to stay really true to what you're doing. So that means oftentimes at the beginning of my business, which some people might say was a is not a good mood because move they publish everything that they do i didn't publish a lot of the very first weddings i did because it wasn't actually who i wanted to attract so i did keep creating looks of what i did want to attract and now especially being in new york i do attract those more fashion conscious brides not conscious not like it's like a awareness but like fashion obsessed brides that want that um so yeah, that's kind of a really typical answer and one that you've heard a million times before. But what would help me, um, Manda Weaver, to get that better for you is probably to look over what you're doing. Because I have this little game, this like trick I play. I love it. I like to look at websites and I can tell you pretty much down to the dollar <laughs> what you're booking. I can say you're you are booking 2895 packages. I can tell from everything <laughs> you're posting. And they're like, why am I not booking $5,000 clients? And there's this place in our business, it's called a blind spot, where we think we're putting $5,000 work out there, but people who've actually booked $5,000 work can look at it and say, you're marketing to the $2,500 bride, maybe at the top 3,500. And that's what I find with most people who are not bringing in the clients they want. Now, it is an evolution. You're not gonna bring them in overnight. You have to elevate your brand, but you're gonna get those lucky breaks. Like I remember the first break I got was this gorgeous couple from Los Angeles and their um, wedding photographer got this huge offer to like go shoot at Vogue. And so she couldn't come to their wedding. They were getting married in two weeks and I got the call. They had found me last minute. I didn't have a booking that day. And everything about that wedding was like everyone arrived and it was just like a project runway of models and high-end gowns and couture. And they were just the richest people I'd ever worked for. But that shoot, 
I just took that and marketed it. I got a six page spread in a magazine with it to really start my brand. I went and redid a lot of the images on my website immediately. Oh my gosh. So you're going to get those breaks, you guys. Don't think that you won't. When you keep putting good stuff out into the universe, this is my Pollyanna attitude that people talk about, but I truly believe it. When it's you keep true. putting good things out and good work out, you're going to get the lucky breaks and you're going to get those clients, especially if you're thinking about it. Here's the crazy thing. I have been, now this is where I get woo woo, but the month before I booked that couple, <clears throat> I had um, $7,000, $7,200 written on a big piece of paper above my desk. And I, it was the last payment of like this credit card that I had put a ton of stuff on the year before for my own education. And I wanted to pay them off. And I was like, I need $7,200. I need $7,200. It's coming into me every day. I would look at that number and be like, I have it. It's coming. So when that lady called me and said, Hey, my photographer can't come. She called me. I was at a marketing conference. I took the call. I'm like, who is this person calling me from LA? And she's like, so what could you, what would you charge me for eight hours of coverage up at Sundance? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, $7,200. I didn't even have, I didn't even have, I wasn't even, I was in the mountains at this marketing camp and I didn't even have internet. And I said, $7,200. She said, great, write up the contract and send it over. I just said 7,200 and um, I made 7,200, you, you know, paying off the bill. And that to me is the magic that comes in when you're working, working. Am I talking too much? I'll stop. No, you're good. I think that's so true. And I think, you know, so many people, especially if, if people in the wedding industry will sort of be like, but where do these come from? Like they think if they just get like one blog post published or the right blog post or the right Instagram post, like, they'll get all 10 of their wedding, like they'll get 10 wedding clients from one place. But it's like, yeah. it's like, that's not the way that it happens. Like things trickle in. It's like every, I don't know about you, but it's like, I feel like every time I'm like, I'm like, I, you told me that when we were working together, like if you put good things out into the universe, they'll come back to you. And, and it's a big step of faith. Like not even to be religious at all. It's a faith thing that you just put it out there. And, and I feel like that's something that I've tried to do so much over the last year is to just put out really good quality content as the very best that I can all the time and to not yeah. settle for anything less than that. And then every time a client comes in to book, it's like, it's a surprise. It's like, oh my gosh, they found something, something happened. They got led back to me and now they're emailing me. You know what I mean? Like it's all, or like, they're they've been following for a while and now is the time you know what i mean yeah. it's just like mm -hmm. things are just trickling in from anywhere and so when it's like you talk about networking it's not like oh you've got to make you've got to make this connection with one person or these three people are your connections even though you're like i've got these two planners and it's awesome like that's awesome but like a lot of different other things like it, it's all like I don't know I feel like it's like branches I feel like they keep going like this because it's like little leaves and they're like cast yeah. they're like getting catching the sun and anyway if there's not one there's not one answer there's a million answers and there's some that you're going to be really good at and there's some that you're not going to be that good at and so stick to what you're really good at like Darcy's really yeah. good, good at some things that you won't be good at and vice versa me too yeah I'm good at, no, I'm good at everything <laughs> Emma I'm good at everything I don't know what you're talking about just kidding. Somebody please come clean my house and make me dinner. Um, okay. So we're going to end this pretty, I think right now, I, I think, you know, we've put a lot of good information out there today. Give us some hearts. I want to see those hearts over there just for fun, just because they're fun. Um, we've got 49 of you on the call. So I know something happened. You went like really right. I'm an angel. Um, so thank you, Stacy. Thank you for the love. I really appreciate that you did that. I'm asking for it. Sometimes you just have to ask for what you want. That's what I find, especially in like a romantic relationship. Like it would be great if you would just buy me this on Valentine's Day. I'm not a red roses type of person. If you buy me red roses, what are you we asking? Are I don't up. know what to tell Michael to get for me. <clears throat> I, I just tell them to get one from soil and stem or tinge floral. I love live flowers, but if they bring me red oh, roses, but still no. flowers. Oh, yeah, I want no. garden roses and ranunculus and beautiful colors in like a handmade ceramic pot from Notary Ceramics. Is that too much to ask? No, I don't think so. Um, all right, you guys. So just really quickly, we want to invite you to come with us to the Utah Path Workshop 
We have a bazillion shoots planned. We have a whole day of, if you enjoyed this one hour, imagine this times 12 with actual step-by-step. -step. I don't give a lot away on the calls. I give some good information, but I have a marketing plan we're gonna take you through. Um, and I'm relaunching. So my websites go out live on Wednesday. And just a little tip for all of you, I am putting a $200 off coupon for most of the workshops except for Thailand. Um, that one you just have to pay full price because it's freaking expensive. But everything else, sorry, kombucha. Everything else is $200 off on Wednesday for 24 hours to celebrate my new launch. So come buy a ticket. Come see Emma and I. Come work with us. Come work with your storytelling and um, build a better brand. And we will give you all the information that we possibly can. Thank and get, so enter the giveaway today. Huh? Enter the giveaway oh, today, yes, too. Emma, tell that. Tell that. We have, a, we have 10 more hours on it, I think. Yeah. So Emma I has been gracious something? enough to give us a $100 gift card to Pilgrim & Co., her amazing, amazing, amazing shop. This is out of just the goodness of her heart. I use her styling boards everywhere. She even made me travel size ones that like changed my life. So we are, Emma's giving away on my Instagram a hundred dollars. So you could get a board, you can get, what else can they get? Emma, Emma, tell them what they'll win. Oh man, there's so many things that you can get. I have so many different styles of surfaces that you can get. My best sellers are, are the plaster ones. Those are kind of the classics, but there's also some antique linen that I hand dyed, or you could get not dyed. And there's also some antique rugs. So those look beautiful and can definitely elevate. Um, but then mm -hmm. there's also, I have like wooden paddles. So those are great for like food styling. And I have, um, I have one last French pitcher that's still there. And, um, Beautiful. Thank you so much, Emma. It's so great of you to do this. And I think the styling boards are kind of just a necessity. They're not even an option at this point. <laughs> so um, yeah, you have to you have to get one of those. You have to take them with you, style everything. We'll be talking a lot about styling at the workshop. Emma will bring a lot of her boards out for you to see and shoot on. But definitely go enter today. It ends at midnight. I use a random name picker. Um, to mention the winner tonight and then yeah you can get a hundred dollars to Emma's store woo woo! a store that I feel so invested in I love that store she put that store together last year when I first met her and it is just a genius store so many beautiful things talk about telling a compelling story if you don't know the reason why it's named Pilgrim and Co go read it it's so awesome Emma is definitely a world traveler with a lot of poetry in her soul and I love it <laughs> thanks Darcy Emma, thanks thank for having you so me much. today thank, thank you thank you so much you are so wise beyond your years and I'm just always impressed with your business knowledge and wisdom and how openly you share it with everyone and I just am so glad that we're friends and know each other in this industry because that's really what it's all about also making beautiful connections with people that you want to work with and and help grow and elevate your business as well so thank you so much all thank right thank you so much later. Darcy see you guys bye guys